Hello and welcome. My name is Kyle Apollett. I'm a PhD student at Case Western Reserve University, and today I'm going to talk about research that my team and I conducted investigating the influences that discrete emotions can have on decision-making processes. So before I begin, I'd like to thank my co-authors for the tremendous amount of work that they've put in developing the paper that we published in this year's conference proceedings, as well as developing the project from which the data that I'll present were collected. So different emotions, moods, and affective states can have very important roles on decision-making. Specifically, they can serve as vital sources of information for decision-making processes. A good example of this is a study conducted by Schwartz and Klor, in which people were telephoned and asked how satisfied they were with their lives in general. And this telephone interview could happen to take place either on a sunny day or a cloudy day for the respondent. And in the case where the experimenters did not ask the respondents specifically about the weather, those who were happening to experience a sunny day tended to rate themselves as more satisfied than those responding on a cloudy day. And the general takeaway here is that emotions, even if they're incidental or ir irrelevant to the decision that's at hand, can still have a significant influence on decision making. So different emotions can have differential effects on decision making processes. Negative affect can produce both approach and avoidance behaviors. Fear can increase post-error slowing and anger can produce more risky behavior. This variance here is perhaps best supported by affect is information theory, which posits that different emotions can differentially be weighted in decision-making processes. This idea here is that is something that my team and I were interested in exploring further. We were interested in how processes of decision diffusion and reinforcement learning were affected by different discrete emotions. And I'll talk more about those two specific processes as I get to the models when I'll present those. Um, so we were particularly interested in how those two processes could be affected by different discrete emotions. And for those emotions, we chose four. Um, we chose happiness, anger, sadness, and desire. Um, of course, there is many other that we could have chose from. We chose those four specifically because they differ in valence and intensity. So to explore the potential modulatory effects that these emotions could have on decision making, we collected data from 31 participants using a two alternative horse choice task in which participants learned probability distributions of reward from two doors. One door had a 75% chance of giving a point which subjects were instructed to maximize and the other had a 25% chance. Participants were, um, were to learn those probabilities over the course of 70 trials. And during that, we collected choice behavior and reaction time. Participants were randomly assigned to four discrete emotion conditions, happy, sad, angry, and desire. And after the 50th trial, they were told to take a break from the decision task and to write about a situation that made them feel most happy, sad, or angry, depending on their condition. If they were in the desire group, they had a slightly different manipulation where they were asked to write about something that they desired most at that moment. So it was prospective instead of retrospective. All participants were instructed to write in such a way that if someone else were to read what they had written, that they might too feel that same feeling. So after this writing manipulation, um, we returned participants to the decision task where they completed the remaining trials. And those trials were considered affective decision-making trials. To test for the efficacy of the manipulations, we administered a discrete emotion questionnaire both before and after the task. And this is a series of nine point self-report scales in which participants are just asked to rate how happy, sad, angry desires they feel at that moment. I'll present the results of those manipulation checks later in the presentation to give our core modeling findings some greater context. So with respect to the reaction time data that we collected, we were interested in a decision diffusion model. So this is a noisy process of evidence accumulation, which can be most simply formalized with four free parameters. So here, alpha is the decision boundary or the amount of evidence that is needed before a choice can be made. Larger boundaries tend to require more time to reach. You need more evidence before you can make a decision. And they tend to reflect an emphasis on accuracy over speed, whereas smaller boundaries take less time to cross but are more prone to error due to noise, reflecting an emphasis on speed over accuracy. Here, Z is the initial bias towards either of these two boundaries. 
Delta is the drift rate or the average rate of evidence accumulation. This is just a general trajectory um, of the noisy random walk that is evidence accumulation. And lastly, tau is the non-decision time. And this is typically anything non-cognitive that is not related to processes of evidence accumulation. For example, stimulus encoding. All of these processes together provide an explanatory model of decision response time. So for this study, we developed a hierarchical Bayesian DDM in which we took three of those free parameters from the canonical DDM, alpha decision boundary, delta drift rate, and tau non-decision time. These parameters were free to vary between individuals and both boundary and drift rates were free to vary between emotion conditions. We did not have any non-decision time uh, varying between conditions as we didn't believe that there was any um, reason for non-decision time to be differentially affected by emotion. So this is a hierarchical model. So each individual level parameter is informed by a group level hyperparameters. You can see here um, the means and standard deviations of those hyperparameters, um, the hyperpriors that we use for those. Um, and this is a good approach for dealing with analyses that have smaller sample sizes. So together, the individual parameters inform a Wiener first passage time distribution, which gives the log probability density of response time at each trial given the free parameters. Last, we set the initial bias to a flat 0.5, assuming no bias for these analyses. So for our choice data, we developed a similar Ohio hierarchical Bayesian model, but for reinforcement learning. So here we used two free parameters, eta learning rate and beta sensitivity to noise. Both of these vary between individuals and conditions as well. So the learning rate informed a simple Q learning update rule in which the expected value of some option, say the door representing the upper bound on the DDM, would be updated on each trial with a reward prediction error of the previous trial scaled by some learning rate. So with that, higher rates would mean bigger swings in reward expectation following feedback. Um, both the Q values and noise sensitivity informed a softmax logistic choice rule, which approximated the probability of selecting some option over other options. So here, if beta is large, the difference in value between the two doors would be more important for choice selection. Choices would be more exploitative or deterministic. Smaller beta here would render any difference in expected values to be negligible, um, lending to explorative stochastic behavior that's on the cusp of 50-50 probability. So to combine both of these two models, to look at both in tandem, we took the individual drift rate parameter that and um, had that scale the expected value difference be, um, between both doors for a trial specific drift rate. So the reinforcement learning parameters inform the Q values, which can modulate drift rate, and the DDM parameters inform the Wiener first passage time distribution. Now, with this formalization, we have a different interpretation of drift rate. When we talk about drift rate with this model, we're actually talking about this scalar which is the weight that expected value differences could have in evidence accumulation. So a large scalar would suggest that participants are accumulating evidence that is value-driven, whereas a small scalar suggests value-free decision-making for the most part. So after we fit this hybrid RLDDM to participant choice and response time data, we calculated the differences between the posterior distributions of emotion condition parameters and neutral parameters. So here we plot the difference posterior, which is a 95% um, highest density interval as a black bar, and the region of practical equivalence to zero as a green bar. So using a HDI plus rope decision rule, if 95% of the difference posterior were practically equivalent to zero or inside of the rope, we would decide that a parameter was no different between neutral and emotion conditions. If the HDI were entirely outside of the rope, however, we would decide that there was a substantial difference between conditions. The rope here was specified as half of Cohen's small effect size, so we tested for small effects or greater. Any overlap that would happen to be between the HDI and rope that doesn't fit within those two criteria um, would be considered weak evidence and just left to interpretation. 
So now turning to the results, we first look at the boundary separation or the amount of evidence needed to make a decision. We found pretty strong effects across all contrasts. We found that the happy condition required less evidence than the neutral condition, and that the sad, angry, and desire conditions all required more evidence than the neutral condition. As such, it appears that people in the happy condition were more focused on speed over accuracy, and people in the sad, angry, and desire conditions were more focused on accuracy over speed. Turning to drift rate, or our formalization, to the extent that, um, to which expected value differences play a role in evidence accumulation, we find mostly similar but weaker effects. We found that the happy condition weighted expected values as less important as evidence than the neutral condition did, as did the angry condition. On the other hand, the sad and desire conditions weighted expected value more as evidence than, than the neutral condition did. Taken together with um, the boundary separation findings, this suggests that people in the happy condition were most likely to make fast but noisy decisions, whereas people who were in the sad and desire conditions were more prone to making slow but accurate decisions. Anger, interestingly, required more evidence, but their evidence accumulation processes were less focused on value. Next, turning to learning rate. We didn't see too many effects here, but we did see that the sad condition was just on the cusp of having a substantially uh, greater learning rate than did the neutral condition. And this indicates that people in the, in the sad condition were more prone to larger expected value swings following feedback. And last, turning to noise sensitivity, we found that people in the happy condition versus neutral were more explorative or stochastic in their decision making, and that people in the sad and desire conditions versus neutral were more, explo were more exploitative or deterministic in their decision making. And turning back to our manipulation checks, we found some results that put our modeling findings in better context. So first, we found that our happy and anger manipulations were successful with people in the happiness condition reporting a two point increase in happiness and people in the anger condition reporting a uh, 3.2 point increase in anger. However, we did not um, find evidence supporting the success of our sad and desire manipulations. This might explain why some of our sad and desire parameter effects are similar in profile. So that said, these are self-report measures. So while there may not have been a subjective conscious change in emotional experience for these two conditions, there may be unconscious processes at play driven by manipulation specific variables. In sum, we found that happiness was associated with requiring less evidence and an emphasis on speed. Happy individuals also tended to give less weight to expected value when accumulating evidence for a decision, and as such, their choices were quite noisy and explorative. Anger was associated with requiring more evidence and an emphasis on accuracy. However, angry individuals also didn't put much stock into expected value, so decisions there are likely to be value-free and slow. Evidence suggested that people in the sad and desire conditions emphasized accuracy and more heavily considered expected value as evidence. However, since our manipulations didn't check out for those two conditions, we can't make many claims about this propensity for exploitation um, and whether it was driven by conscious subjective changes in experience. For future directions, we're interested in replicating these effects with a larger sample and more successful manipulations, specifically for sadness and desire. We're currently analyzing data from a newer study with 200 plus participants and look forward to sharing those results in the near future. Um, we're also interested in testing alternative models. Some examples of modifications we'd like to make are separate learning rates for positive versus negative feedback, dynamic boundaries that are modulated by expected utility in a similar way to what we did for drift rate, and alternatives to the softmax logistic choice rule. Thank you for listening to this presentation. If you have any questions, please feel free to email me. I'm happy to answer any questions that I can in the Q&A or offline. Thank you again for listening, and I hope that you all enjoy the rest of the conference.